Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And can I first of all ask you to give a very warm round of applause for our musician tonight, Jamie Lemercier. I would like to welcome all of you to SOAS, particularly those of you who have traveled a long way to be here. And a very special welcome to Professor Costa Lapovitas's friends and colleagues. And a thank you also to those from other institutions who have joined us. A SOAS inaugural is very, very special. It's a cause for celebration and an intellectual event for the whole SOAS community. This is the second of this year's inaugural lecture series. Professor Makota Ito will introduce Professor Lapovitas tonight. Dr. Ito is Emeritus Professor of the University of Tokyo. He is one of the leading political economists in the world, and he has taught widely at many universities including the New School for Social Research at New York University, Tamasat University in Bangkok, Cambridge University, London University, York University in Canada, at the University of Sydney. And he has written extensively. Dr. Ito has worked with La Dr. Lapovitas for 25 years and invited him to join the University of Tokyo as an associate professor for a year in 1993. This association led to the co-authored book, Political Economy of Money and Finance. Professor Terence Byers will deliver the vote of thanks. Terence Byers is Emeritus Professor of Political Economy at the University of London. He joined SOAS as a research fellow in economics in 1962 for the Department of Economic and Political Studies, which was founded that year. During his long tenure at SOAS, he was the first head of the new economics department, which was established in 1990. Professor Byers is best known for his work on agrarian political economy and has written extensively on the comparative political economy of historical agrarian change in a variety of countries. His last book, Capitalism from Above and Capitalism from Below, is a comparison of capitalist agrarian transition in Prussia and the United States. One final point in terms of introduction. Many of you will tweet during the lecture. I encourage you to do this, but please make sure that your phones are in silent mode. I'm very grateful to Professor Ito and also to Professor Byers for being part of this evening's event. Please also join us for the drinks reception in the area just outside the lecture theatre at the conclusion of the lecture. To introduce Professor Lapovitas, I will now pass over to Professor Ito. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to uh, celebrate and to in introduce inaugural lecture by newly promoted Professor Costas Rafaitas here at SOAS. Uh, I still remember when, um, very well when he first visited me a quarter century ago already at my office in the University of Tokyo. He, he <clears throat> gave me very strong impression as an intellectual, active, and honest person, knowing what he wants to work on. He was not yet 30 years old in my memory, and <clears throat> uh, 25 years <clears throat> younger than I. <clears throat> He was on the way back to London from Hokkaido, the northern big island in Japan, after working for several months at Hokkaido Takshoku 
Bank, a, a traditionally leading bank in Hokkaido. His work there had, in my belief, nothing to do with its tragic bankruptcy in 1997. <laughs> As a rare case among Western scholars in economics, he uh, could command Well, very good. Uh, not very fluent Japanese language. <laughs> he did not take much time to convince me of his deep interest as well as academic background in theories of money and finance and studies of Japanese economy. Therefore, I asked him to work with me as an associate professor of economics at the University of Tokyo for a year in 1993. We enjoyed weekly regular discussion group meeting with a young colleague and postgraduate student together with more frequent mutual communication. Our plan to write a joint work, Political Economy of Money and Finance, Macmillan and St. Martins, 1999, was naturally started in the summer of this year, 1993. We believed that the uh, <coughs> veritable renaissance of Anglo-Saxon radical political economy since the 1970s relatively uh, neglected the roles of money and finance in comparison with Japanese tradition in political economy. In, my, in view of interesting importance of this topic in contemporary world economy, it seemed very necessary to present and promote systematic theoretical studies of money and finance from the view of political economy in English. Costas contributed very much on the, uh, <clears throat> the assessment of long history of theories of money and finance since the classical political economy, Marxian political economy, Keynesian and post-Keynesian economics. In our understanding, James Stewart in 19, uh, sorry, in 18th century, Karl Marx in 19th century, and John Maynard Keynes in 20th century, uh, three by far great memorable <coughs> monetary theorists. They all believed in importance of function of money holding, unlike the mainstream classic or neoclassical economic, economist. Costas' Costas's paper uh, in 2000 clarified that in Marx's analysis of monetary holding is based objective foundation upon turnover of capital itself and not depend on subjective personal psychological expectation unlike in Keynesian tradition. It was very interesting <coughs> paper and <coughs> The, uh, the objective foundation, why incentive among business circles moves in certain direction at certain period of time must be similarly important also in the analysis of contemporary bubbles and their collapses. Following our joint work, when <coughs> it was translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Greek, Costas published the Social Foundation of Market, Money, and Credit in 2003 from Routledge and edited Financialization in Crisis from Brill 2012 and, uh, and wrote many other articles. He established his professional position as a leading political economist of money and finance, especially on, on recent global financialization. Financialization seemed to me a little bit clumsy 
wording, but it became very, very popular now following his work. His style of <clears throat> research is always respects objective reasons and foundations for any uh, socioeconomic issues separate from ideological judgment. In this regard, his style is quite close to an original political theorist, Kozo no Mai Forana in Japan, and his followers in Japan called Uno School, seriously attempting to develop Marxian political economy as an objective social science. However, he showed exceptionally clear political view in his analysis, Eurozone crisis, and argued clearly for uh, <clears throat> Greek to withdraw from Euro as an uh, so as to regain Greeks' independent budgetary and politi budgetary policies, among others, as <clears throat> we will uh, probably hear in his lecture today as well. He attracted global attention on this argument in the wor world scale and became even Greek MP, as you know, I was honestly uh, worried very much if he <laughs> becomes tragic papandrel and uh, leading Kenyan political economist and president, if not Socrates. <laughs> Probably Costas knew what I felt and worried as he never came in contact with me in those two years' time. He has successfully made <clears throat> many, many reliable friends in Japan by his friendly personality and annually attracted many scholars from Japan to SOAS. I also enjoyed meeting widely international excellent excellent graduate student in his seminar every time when I visit here. Probably for younger generations in many countries, including Japan, who potentially want to come to SOAS to learn from him or work with him, this inaugural lecture is a wonderful news uh, <clears throat> rather than the previous news on him to be elected as a Greek MP. <laughs> I think, I thank all related persons in SOAS to get him back from Greek political circle and <laughs> would like to ask them to treat him favorably enough, not just today, in order not to lose him anymore for the future as a key academic professor to work for the world. Thank you. I'd like, first of all, to um, thank Makoto Ito for his kind words. He's never been anything other than very generous towards me. I'd also like to thank all of you for coming to this uh, occasion, which is um, an important day for me. Now, I was once told by a reliable source that an inaugural lecture should be heard, but not seen. Now, I will follow this advice and I will discuss broadly and fairly loosely what uh, I have been doing for many years in the past uh, and also pointing towards what I might be doing in the near future. Now, for much of my academic career, I have researched money. 
I have not researched money as a matter of policy alone, monetary policy in its institutions. I've looked into that, but mostly I've researched money as an economic, social, and political phenomenon. A key concern of mine has been and remains, actually it's become more so, money is power. The power represented by money and the power magnified and delivered by money. And so I want to talk about that in this lecture, particularly in view of my recent involvement in public affairs to which uh, Makoto Ito has referred to, to, has referred. And I will talk about money as political power, where it comes from, and what does it do. Now, I've called money an invisible bind for purposes of this uh, lecture, an invisible bind on both individuals and society. We need to go into this uh, at some depth in order to understand where the power of money comes from. Money is an invisible bind because, of course, it holds the market economy. and provides the means for adjusting consumption and production. That's how we do it. It's also the thing that provides a bridge for allowing current decisions um, to affect the future. It is the uh, instrument for effecting saving and investment. So quite clearly, money is the thing that keeps together the glue, the nexus rerum of an unplanned market economy. But money is not just that. It's also a bind because it welds together, it keeps together a whole host of social beliefs, of customs and practices. So money spurs the basest instincts of humanity. Cupidity, acquisitiveness, dishonesty, you name it, it's there. But at the same time, it offers a certain sense of independence, of freedom even, of a certain kind, to the individual. If you can pay, you don't depend on others. So in the perfectly opposite terms of English uh, colloquialism, if you can pay, you're your own boss. At the same time, money breaks ancient traditions, obligations, understandings, and it creates its own. It creates its own fluid monetary interdependence. Society becomes anonymous and linked through money and obligated through money. Famous uh, sociologist and anthropologist Marcel Mauss understood this very well and counterposed the world of the gift with its own obligations and mutual obligations and generating the need for a counter gift to the world of the commodity, which of course contains money and which has no uh, need to reciprocate once the transaction has been completed. All these, I believe, are elements of the power of money in, mo in modern society. They've been multiplied, they've been expanded and augmented, and there is no better exemplar of all this than my own home country, Greece, to which I will turn uh, in the course of this lecture. Now then, <clears throat> where does the complex, multi-layered, economic, social, individual, etc., character of money come from? What is the source of this power? And I mean what is the source of this power theoretically, not uh, in immediate everyday terms. It's in this connection that we need to approach the issue with sophisticated political economy and do some profound theoretical searching. And we could do worse than uh, go to Karl Marx on this issue. Um, Karl Marx wrote a lot on money, some of you might know. In fact, he quipped, um, no one has written more about money amidst a greater lack of it because he was skinned, obviously, while he was writing on money. 
For me, his writings were of critical importance, and they became even more important when I came into contact with the Japanese tradition of the Uno school. And through doing so, even my command of Japanese became more fluent <laughs> and better in the course of time. Um, so we should start with that, but I should hasten to add, Marx is no more than a starting point uh, on this issue, no more than that, a point of departure. A lot more needs to be said, is necessary uh, to say in order to comprehend modern money, especially in social and political role today. And two aspects of money are key, both of which I will develop briefly in the coming few minutes. First, money is a thing of the market. We must start with that. It's a creature of the market. Money emerges in the process of commodity exchange, which is another word for the market, a little bit more precise. It is an economic entity, first and foremost. Hence, we must start with economics. There is no analysis of money that really carries weight, which doesn't start with economics. But second, money is also a thing of the non-market, and even of the non-economic. Money is also a category and an entity that pervades social practice, shapes perceptions, feelings, behaviors, and so on, and no one has discussed that better than Georg Zimmel, the um, famous sociologist who opened the path for all of us to consider these um, aspects of money. As contemporary sociologists like to say, money is a social relation. I like the way this is said in contemporary sociology. It's as if it's a major discovery. Yes, of course it's a social relation. The real issue is what kind of social relation. And that's what I want um, to spend a little bit more time on. I believe that the social relation that's at the heart of money and helps us understand the power of money is a relation, a relation of asymmetry. Money is something that contains an asymmetry with it uh, organically, intrinsically. It's the asymmetry between the seller and the buyer. This notion that there is an asymmetry between the seller and the buyer comes directly from Marx's analysis of the forms of value, the dialectic of the forms of value, one of the most uh, famous sections, of parts of Marx's writings, one of these things that will continue to be read for centuries um, in the future. Uh, it's basically a kind of microeconomics, but um, philosophically informed. And essentially the argument is when two agents meet in the market, when two commodity owners meet in the market, one of them is the relative or the active, and the other is the equivalent or the passive, as Marx calls them. The key thing here is the active makes the passive in this uh, kind of analysis. The active offers a good for sale, the passive accepts and gives own good in return, buys, in other words. Money, in this kind of analytics, comes out of the dialectical interplay between the active and the passive. And we have, a, we have a classic exposition of the dialectic here, how one form leads to the next until we get money. I should hasten to add here that Marx's active and passive are not actually his, but they come from Aristotle. They come from Aristotle, and in particular, they come from Aristotle's uh, discussion of nature and the human mind in uh, the, the, the anima, uh, where Aristotle discusses the existence of the passive and the active side in nature. The active is the cause, the energy. It is, in Greek, topion. The passive is that which potentially becomes a kind. It is topaskon. And so with the mind. There is the active mind and the passive mind. And the active mind makes the passive mind, argues Aristotle. Because you see, for Aristotle, as for Marx, the active is always superior to the passive. That is how the Aristotelian uh, logic works on this uh, issue. So approaching the question from this perspective, money is the universal equivalent. Money is the thing that passively acquires this role from acting by the other commodities. It's the other commodities that make money into what it is. 
And so in this approach uh, to the issue, money is the thing that buys all others because the other commodities may do so. But of course, it isn't merely economics that makes money thus. For you see, money acts as money also because people expect it to, ask, to act as money. It is a matter of beliefs and of the asymmetry of beliefs in society. People invest in money uh, a social belief of its unique acceptability. They give it a peculiar asymmetric usefulness of the thing that can buy others. This belief occurs in the context of societies that contain trading and markets. Societies that have the market as an integral aspect of them. It reflects the separateness of traders from each other, the foreignness of traders from each other, and it allows traders to relate to each other without violence, without violence and war. It is the link between traders that allows them uh, to give and take. The conjunction of commodity interaction and social beliefs gives to money its unique place in society, makes it the unique category that it is. Money then is absolute buying and paying power in a society that integrally contains the market. That is the source of money's social and political power. That is why money is such a powerful category uh, and operates so powerfully uh, in the modern world. So let's come to the modern world. I've also been looking into money and capitalism for quite a while. And we need to say something useful about modern money and modern capitalism. Money, of course, predates capitalism. Money is not a capitalistic thing. Uh, money was present in societies lost in the mists of ancient times. So it predates uh, money, it's an ancient phenomenon. Capitalism makes money its own. It is unthinkable with, without money. Uh, capital must be invested in the money form, profit accrues in the money form. Uh, capitalism is based on money in important ways, but it transforms money, and that's really what matters in this context. Of all societies that have dealt with money, none has transformed money more profoundly than capitalism has done. None has incorporated so fully and transformed it uh, so thoroughly. How? And here things will start to become a bit more interesting, I believe, because we will approach modern times. There is commodity money, of course. All of us are familiar with commodity money in one way or another, gold and silver. The capitalist world inherits commodity money from previous societies. It makes it its own. It uses it, and it kept using it throughout this century, or the previous century. Um, but it isn't as important to the operations of capitalism as other forms of money. The capitalist world also gives birth to fiat money. In other words, symbols of the money commodity created by the state. Things that replace gold and silver and circulate based on the arbitrary say-so of the state. We know, and we have known many forms of that during the last two centuries, when the modern state has created these symbols time and time again. The best known case is perhaps the assignat of the French Revolution, but since then we've seen many, many uh, of these occasions uh, of uh, fiat money circulating widely. The truly capitalist form of money, however, is neither commodity money nor fiat money. The truly capitalist form of money is credit money. The money that the capitalist world creates in profusion and really rests on is the money created by the financial institutions. It is credit money, it is bank liabilities, it is bank deposits, uh, things created privately as banks make loans. Private money is the dominant form of money uh, in the modern world, a byproduct of the banking business. This private money, however, is backed by the ultimate means of payment, by legal tender, as it must be, and the legal tender has the backing of the state, although it's created by a bank itself. This is a very special bank. It's a bank 
has got a public character. So modern money is a hybrid. It's private, but resting on public fiat for its acceptability. It is managed money for this reason. In Keynes' terms, it is managed money. We live then in a world of managed money, and to understand the power of money, we must understand the nature of its management. Money is exceptionally powerful today because it is managed. And the nature of its power, and the forces that lead to its power can be better understood because of the management process. Money then is managed domestically. It is perfectly clear that it is managed domestically, and it is managed by the central bank, the key institution um, of modern capitalism, the dominant public institution. It is a public monopoly, a gigantic public monopoly over the means of final payment. Its monopoly rests on public credit. In other words, it rests on the state. We should never lose sight of that. The modern world is a world that talks about free markets, liberalism or neoliberalism, but that is based on an absolute monopoly by, over the final means of payment by an institution that's a state institution, fundamentally, that relies uh, on public credit. The power of money, modern money then, is condensed in the power of the central bank and attains a public aspect. It becomes a public lever. The crisis of 2007-2009 demonstrated amply the incredible power of money and the way in which it's used in modern society. For the crisis was overcome using a variety of measures, two of which were of fundamental importance. The first was the provision of abundant liquidity by the central bank to the private banks. Abundant liquidity means, very simply, creating the legal tender, the, the final means of payment, freely by the central bank by resting on public credit. Second, driving the rate of interest down to zero. This is an unprecedented development in the history of capitalism. Interest rates being driven down to zero have been kept there for years. And that, again, is done because of the absolute command by the central bank over money. It would have been impossible otherwise. Public credit, then, has been deployed in the interests of private capital during the last few years. It's been a huge public subsidy, and that's exactly how the power of money works uh, in modern society in the domestic sphere. But there's also the international dimension. Money is also managed internationally. And here things become much more complex. Because internationally, there is no single authority that manages modern money. There is no such thing. World money, the money that's used globally for payment, for reserve creation, and for holding wealth, is of course, fundamentally, the US dollar. What is the US dollar? A domestically created money. It is managed, but not conjointly. It is managed by US authorities. So what have we got here? A huge privilege for the United States. The power that accrues to the United States is vast. It gives it freedom from, to, to, to exercise monetary policy. It transfers surpluses from the rest of the world to the United States as the rest of the world keeps reserves of dollars at 0%. This is a vital part of US hegemony. It is a vital component of modern power, exercised through modern money. It is, to put it differently, a huge asymmetry, magnified from the seller and the buyer into the world stage that takes us directly into the political realm. The political power of the United States globally very much depends on its particular access to global money, world money. Which, at last, brings me to the euro. The euro is a very peculiar form of money. We must start with how peculiar it is. 
and understand the peculiarity. It is very peculiar because first, it is a domestic form of money for all 19 participants in the monetary union. At the same time, however, it's an international form of money, the main competitor of the US dollar globally. It is managed by an array of transnational institutions in Europe based on treaties agreed among sovereign states. It didn't have to be thus. There was no need for the euro to be constructed in that way. There was no need for Europe to create a money that would be thoroughly domestic as well as international, acting in both realms at the same time. It was a huge leap taken by Europe, um, European Union, into the unknown, and it's a leap that has failed, I will argue. The main managing agent of the euro is, of course, the European Central Bank. The power of the European Central Bank comes very clearly in the first instance from the commanded exercises over the money market of Europe. It commands the money market and it commands the behavior of the banks in the money market. That's where it draws the first elements of its power, which it then passes on to the money it creates. The difference with other managing agents of this type of money, in the case of the euro, of course, is that the European Central Bank has got no stake behind it whether a unitary state or a federal state. There is no equivalent to what other central banks would have and thus acquire the power they need to support um, the fiat money they create. The European Central Bank is a very private central bank. It's bizarre, it's a very strange arrangement. It's a very private central bank that creates a form of legal tender that reflects an alliance of states. It is a presumed alliance of equals, except that some are more equal than others in this uh, arrangement. The power of the euro, created in this way and managed in this way, has rebounded in the interests of one of the members of the alliance more than anywhere else, Germany in particular, and in doing so, he has created vast asymmetries in Europe. And it is these asymmetries that make the project of the monetary union and of the European Union itself highly untenable in the coming years. How has German power then been projected through the euro? There's a series of steps here. A series of steps evolving around this modern form of money. The first and very clear step is domestic in Germany, wage restraint. The main source of German power obtained through the euro is wage restraint. It's a matter of domestic class relations in Germany. That's where it comes from. It's because German wages have been, have been effectively frozen or risen very little for 15 years. This, in a system of fixed monetary arrangements, is a vast source of competitive advantage for Germany. This is where it comes from. Not through technological prowess, efficiency, or anything else. Plain, simple wage freeze or wage restraint. So that's the first element. The second element is fiscal restraint in Europe, including Germany, through the Stability and Growth Pact. Austerity. Austerity spread across Europe. Uh, emanating from Berlin, basically, uh, as the type of policy that needs to apply to, to Europe. The third, an ideology of reform, neoliberal reform across Europe, and this reform means basically privatizations and liberalization uh, of markets, bringing wages down to the logic being that if other countries did that, then they would themselves gain competitiveness and would be as successful as Germany. This, of course, is a logical non sequitur. It's impossible to do that in the context of uh, a monetary union. And that's not why Germany has succeeded anyway. Be that as it may, these arrangements have afforded Germany vast power in Europe, coming from its surpluses, created in that, that way because of its uh, competitive advantage, and therefore from its lending, from its command over resources denominated in euros. The institutions of the euro sustain German power. Um, 
I believe that this is a unique situation in the history of Europe. I don't think we've seen anything like that ever before. Um, it's, an, it's an extraordinary uh, arrangement of power, imperial power in Europe. Um, but it is also a precarious power, highly precarious power, because the institutions that, that create this power mean that Europe is not growing. The spread of austerity and everything else that goes with it mean, means that Europe is not growing. Unemployment is high. Austerity is also creating reaction in individual countries. The power of the euro might have rebounded in the interests of Germany, but it is throttling the continent. So it's a highly unstable, highly precarious form of domination here and power. And now we come to the case that demonstrates most clearly why this is unsta unstable. Because the color of the euro on the continent is most clearly seen in the case of Greece. And here I want to tell you a few things about other aspects of the power of money that have emerged uh, in the case of Greece, which were a revelation to me uh, in the course of the last few years. For Greece, membership of the euro, of this form of money since 2010, has been nothing other than a complete disaster, economic and social collapse, whichever way you look at it. Remaining in the euro has brought contraction of GDP by 25%, unemployment at 25%, industrial production contracting by 35%, youth unemployment at 50% and more, and youth emigration in vast numbers. The markets of Europe are full of young Greeks, well qualified, seeking jobs uh, right now. The euro then is marginalizing the country. This is perfectly obvious. It was never a very big country. It was never very important in Europe. Now it's becoming utterly marginal as it clings on to the monetary union. A rational observer, any detached rational observer would, would look at the situation and would say immediately, the answer is exit and restructuring the economy in the interest of growth, social justice and equality. It's perfectly obvious from the perspective of monetary theory. It's not an issue in economics, it's trivial. There's nothing to resolve, it's obvious. Greece doesn't belong in this arrangement. And yet it's not happening. It's not happening, doggedly so. And one must ask why? Why is it not happening? It's now six years. This is where the power of money has emerged in a very interesting way. This is what was new to me um, as I observed this situation and became closely uh, involved in it. Here we see the power of money, modern money, in a new guise. And I want to take you through it uh, a little bit. Now, of course, when you approach it in immediate terms, it's fairly clear why this is happening, why Greece is doggedly sticking to this uh, dysfunctional arrangement. First, because of course there are substantial domestic interests that insist that this be the case. And these domestic interests have got names and addresses that are very well known, there's no mystery about them. There are banks and big business, both of which are very keen to keep the country where it is. Um, clearly, so they admit it, they, 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 they say it openly. Second, there's a dysfunctional political system, utterly dysfunctional political system that is incapable of offering to the country um, a new path um, that would make sense, that would actually allow it to, to survive in, in the world division of labor with some prospects of progress and, uh, and, and, and rising incomes and, and, and everything that goes with it. To see how these things relate to money and its power, we have to look more closely of course, at the shambles, that's called Syriza. Now, I don't really want to spend too much time, and there isn't that much time to spend. I only look at it because the, modern, the power of modern money is also political, and by looking at Syriza, one can comprehend what it mean, means. The shambles of Syriza is quite simply unprecedented in political history, I believe. Because Syriza came to power less than a year ago, unbelievable as it might seem, uh, it came to power 
using, deploying a huge range of sensible proposals. The proposals I was making were perfectly sensible. Um, abandon austerity, redistribute income and wealth, nationalize the banks, restructure the debt. Who in the right mind can pick an argument with these proposals? They make sense, it's obvious that they make sense, and there's nothing terribly revolutionary about them. They're just basic, um, fundamental economic sense, even Keynesian in many ways. Then there were several months of negotiation. I'm not gonna comment on the negotiation because I might resort to very rough language if I did that. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's say for the sake of argument that there was negotiation that lasted several months. What was the end result of this brave and hard negotiation? I'll tell you what the result was. Abject surrender. Complete defeat, abject surrender, and for the first time in political history, we have the most incredible phenomenon of a party of the left that gets elected in this way, that promises all these wonderful things, adopting the program of the opposition, and coming around and saying, we will sign a bailout, and a bailout is the only way we can go, and we will implement it. That's what Syriza did. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but that's what, we all know that this is why it did. This is what they did. The question is why? Why? The answer is perfectly obvious and it is admitted by the leadership and high membership of uh, the high cadre of Syriza to stay in the Euro. It wasn't openly said in the beginning. Weasel words were deployed. It was covered in a thousand ways. When it came to it, though, eventually, it was admitted to stay in the euro. This takes priority over everything else. It is actually the euro that has defeated Syriza. Not just defeated it, trounced it. The power of money, modern money, utterly destroyed Syriza as a political agent that was going to change Greece and hopefully Europe and then the world and the universe, of course. Why? How was that possible? Because I repeat, it's an economic issue. It doesn't exist. It's non-existent. Greece doesn't belong in this arrangement. The more it stays in it, the more it destroys its economy and society. It doesn't even arise as an economic problem. How was it possible? What was it? Why was it the euro, as it is constituted as modern money, able to defeat um, this government that came to power with all these promises. And I think that economics is not enough. We need to look into psychology, psychological issues, psychological responses, and behavioral responses. At least that's how it seemed to me after living and being involved in basically in the thick of it for uh, several months. What lies then behind this obsessional attachment to a destructive, malfunctioning monetary association. Well, the power of money in the case of Greece, the modern money of Europe, has appeared in two further forms. The first is fear. If you don't appreciate the importance of fear, you will never understand why Greece is still where it is. Fear, palpable fear that you can cut with a knife. Fear. Uh, in a variety of forms. Fear of banks. The banks were scared of nationalization because they knew any other option would mean becoming nationalized. The fear of big business because they feared that any other option would mean being cut off from the markets. The fear of deposit holders because they feared that if they're not in the euro, they would lose their savings. The fear of the nation as a whole because it feared being isolated being left alone and being destroyed. Fear emanating from money, the form of money, magnified by the mass media and played on a daily basis through all avenues of information. An entire nation has been made prisoner to this form of money in the mind more than anywhere else. And what emerged on top of that what is even more interesting to observe is a form of the Stockholm Syndrome in the case of Greece. Those who run the euro and benefit from it 
and impose the policies that have destroyed the country in order to remain in the euro, the tormentors of the country, essentially, appear in the case of domestic give and take in Greece as the wise people, the ones who understand what is good for us. Because, of course, you see, in a typical case of the Stockholm Syndrome on a national scale, we Greeks are useless. We cannot run a state. We cannot run an economy. We cannot run our affairs. We're dishonest. Uh, we need someone to tell us what to do. That's exactly how polity and, and, and debate has moved in Greece during the last five or six years. And that is the power of modern money. This kind of neo-colonial attitude has been perpetrated through this form of money that has taken over people's minds and made them stick to this arrangement. Second dimension, though, second thing that is made for holding on to this dysfunctional form of money is, of course, identity. And that, I must, understand, I must, I must admit, I had uh, expected even less than fair. Identity is very important for, to, to modern money, precisely because it's managed and is created by institutions, institutions attached to the modern state. The euro makes peripheral European countries European. This is a very important uh, aspect. In the case of Greece, which has always been a small place on the margins, the eastern margins of Europe, always a arm's length from the core of European capitalist development. The Greeks, until quite recently, when they went abroad, went to Europe. That's how they said to each other what was, where they were traveling. Um, the euro has been very important ideologically in that regard. It has made the country in the, minds of its inhabit in the minds of its inhabitants, um, properly European. And not properly European only in the sense that they share the same currency and they belong to the hard core, the inner group, but also better than their neighbors. We might be in the Balkans and in, East, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but we are a notch above because we've got the Euro. This perception, this, this issue of identity is unspoken, not often admitted, but it's there and it's very, very powerful in how people relate to this form of money. And this has created an incredible new tension in Greece of national identity, because the national, which is traditional in terms of what makes you a Greek, has come into conflict with the transnational, which is now associated with the euro, which is inherently transnational. In my judgment, Greece has remained in this this functional arrangement at huge cost to economy and society, fundamentally because of these two factors, fear and identity, manipulated and used by those who've got an interest in keeping the country where it is, no matter the cost. It is a false ideology, but it exists. Now, I've nearly finished. Um, I do not wish to finish on this note, though. <laughs> Um, there must be a positive message. Um, the power of money today, I would say, is probably greater than ever. I don't think there's been a period in the history of capitalism or any other society in which the power of money is greater than today in, in, in contemporary society. But that does not mean that this power cannot be controlled. That does not mean that people and humanity and society are helpless in the face of this Behemoth. Of course, finding ways to control the power of money is an old quest, going back to Aristotle, whom I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. To achieve it, this control, one must intervene in the economic sphere, of course, because this is an economic phenomenon, but also go way beyond it, because money exists in the non-economic as well. And simply intervening in, in the economy is not enough to control the power of money for reasons that I think are now clear, given what I've been saying all this time. And so I would argue three things. First, the power of money can be controlled domestically. But evidently, to control the domestic power of money, what one must do is strengthen the collective and the social, for reasons that should be clear now, 
In other words, one must strengthen access to things, goods, commodities, and so on, that are socially provided. One must strengthen the welfare state and social provision in order to limit the, the domestic power of money. The power of money must also be controlled and restrained internationally. And this means, of course, strengthening cooperative forms of give and take among nations uh, and among different people. And wh what, a be what better place to start than controlling finance, imposing um, regulations and control uh, on finance to limit the power of money globally. Third, the power of money can be controlled in Europe, at least, by dismantling the bind over Europe, that's throttling Europe, by dismantling the monetary um, union, just perhaps in time to avoid the collapse of the union altogether. Because the longer this uh, dysfunctional monetary arrangement persists, the, grave, the graver are the dangers for the European Union uh, as a whole, because it's now become thoroughly intertwined uh, with the monetary arrangements. That as some institutional pointers to what might uh, take place in the years to come. But of course, the most important thing here is not that, really. The most important thing is for those who for thinking critically about the world, for those who want a different set of arrangements, social and other, to prevail in the world, the most important thing here is to find again a narrative, a new politics, a new story that can be told that will break the hold over the mind and the imagination of people exercised by modern money. That's really what we've been deficient are doing. We need to shape the promise of a better, more rational future, one that goes beyond capitalism. Because without a narrative of this type, there is no breaking uh, the power of money. This is what we've got in front of us, and I believe that we must rise to the challenge. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> it remains for me to give the vote of thanks on this important and uh, happy occasion. Firstly, I would thank the school for organizing and supporting this occasion. And in particular, I would thank Samantha Farr for her efficiency and good humor in ensuring that it would run smoothly. So far, it has run smoothly. <laughs> Secondly, I thank the director, Baroness Amos, for opening the proceedings and presiding <coughs> over them. Thirdly, thanks are due to Professor Makoto Ito, uh, who has come a long way from Tokyo to deliver his introduction and has done so uh, cogently, elegantly, and with some humor. Fourthly, I must thank you, <coughs> the audience, for turning up in such numbers and for being, so far as I could see, so attentive. So I was sitting at the front, I couldn't really see you, but still. <laughs> but most of all, I must thank Costas, who has delivered uh, an outstanding lecture, at once rigorous and uh, lucid, with potent contemporary relevance, indeed current and immediate relevance. It's been a great pleasure for me to attend Costas' inaugural lecture and a privilege to uh, follow him <coughs> on the platform. It's always a pleasure to see someone whom one knew as a young scholar who has blossomed into a scholar of considerable standing. When I was head of the new, as it was then, Department of Economics at SOAS, which had separated from Economic and Political Studies in 1990, he, his was one of the early appointments for which I was responsible. When he was appointed to a lectureship in economics in April of uh, 1991, he was clearly, very clearly, 
an accomplished political economist. In the intervening period, he has become powerfully so. Incidentally, talk about his uh, linguistic uh, qualities. We, in fact, at the time, were extremely impressed, as well as by his political economy, by his uh, remarkable li ling linguistic competence, as well as his native Greek. He was fluent uh, in English, and he had a working knowledge of French, Russian, and classical Greece. And although he spoke little Japanese in 1990, he rapidly actually became fluent in Japanese and able to lecture in Japanese in Tokyo. That, I think, was no mean feat. Now, <clears throat> obviously, I don't want to recapitulate his lecture, but very, very briefly, what struck me about the lecture was his pointing to money's diffuse, per pervasive power. It's market power and it's power as a social relation. He has noted the vast power conveyed by money uh, to the United States, the great power it gives to Germany as a surplus country and as a chief lender in Europe. He has considered the Greek collapse, the economic and social disaster since 2010, and the fear in Greece endemic among banks, among businesses and deposit holders and alarmingly, the widespread and continuing fear of the <clears throat> unknown. As he says, we have a form of money that is holding a nation to hostage. He has argued the need to restrain the power of money domestically, to strengthen uh, the, uh, the collective and the social, and to restrain the power of money internationally, and all in all, to dismantle as he says himself, the bind that is throttling Europe. Hercules himself faced, at one level, faced no greater labours, yet we remind ourselves that Hercules was successful with immense effort. I, I wouldn't like to finish without noting an important aspect of Costas's work, the fact that his, his work and his lecture, indeed, is informed by a very strong historical sense. That's a quality not always displayed by economists. Indeed, it is seldom displayed by economists. And in particular, his work is rooted in a rich knowledge of the history of economic thought. He has, of course, published extensively in the field of uh, political economy of money and finance. Those familiar with his work will know of his mastery of writing on money and finance back to and including, including most notably classical political economy. I would finish where he started when he quoted the aphorism that inaugural lectures, generally speaking, should be heard and not seen. Well, it was in fact a, someone who taught me at the University of Glasgow, a very accomplished political economist, the late Ronald Meek, who actually made that observation, and he made, made it, I think, 14 years after he had delivered his own inaugural lecture at the University of Leicester in 1964. He eventually decided to publish it, and in fact, Meek's inaugural lecture was eminently worthy of being seen, of being read. So too is the one that we have just heard. Having heard it, I will certainly read it too. So also, I am sure, will many of you uh, who have listened to it. SOAS is indeed fortunate to have Costas as a member of its professoriate. He brings to econom the economic department and to SOAS true quality and distinction. Thank you.